Welcome to the Post Questionnaire. 35 questions giving us insight into what makes creative people tick. Hi, Caroline. Uh, thrilled about today's guest. Oh, I am too. Yes. We actually recorded this uh, interview a while ago before the lockdown, but our guest has remained in a very active public presence throughout the pandemic in advocating for universal testing as a way to help um, uh, mitigate the disastrous economic effects of the pandemic. And uh, I speak with such knowledge about this guest because he is my husband, the economist Paul Romer. So I'm thrilled and I I was just looking at Paul's uh, Twitter and of course I've known Paul through you and through NYU where he also teaches and I knew him before he won the Nobel Prize and I'm, I'm delighted that he still talks to me when he's so busy after the Nobel Prize because of course everybody <laughs> wants to talk to him. So on his Twitter, it's, uh, his, his handle is Paul M. Romer and it says economist macro, coder, Python, optimist, mostly. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's a pretty accurate summary of, of who this man is, at least uh, professionally. So yeah, and the optimism is a really interesting strain in his career. He, he became famous at quite a young age as a scholar for um, basically showing, ec- from what I understand, from showing uh, ec- economists how to account for mathematically in macroeconomic modeling, how to account for human innovation. And this kind of looking at the long sweep of history and how human innovation just advanced societies by leaps and bounds over and over and over again uh, was a real cause for optimism for Paul kind of philosophically for a long time. And I think that that um, has now kind of bumped up against uh, a, a much more if not uh, pessimistic, a much more sobered view of where we are now with the lockdown, with the political situation in America, with um, now kind of a resurgence, uh, luckily, of Black Lives Matter, but all in response to really horrifying events in the United States. So when he says an optimist, mostly, I think it's meant to capture his sort of professional uh, reputation as somebody who always spoke in favor of how much we can do as a society, how much science and politics and intellectual activity can change things for the better. And um, yeah, I I know if he got to re-record the Proust questionnaire with us post-pandemic, his answers would probably be quite a bit different to many of the questions, but it will still be fun to, uh, to hear how he thinks. And he's both a theorist, so he teaches as a professor. He was before at Stanford at the Institute for Economic Policy and the Hoover Institution, but he's also a practitioner. So he was senior vice president and chief economist at the World Bank. He's run companies and sold them and businesses. So I think that perspective of being both in the real world and also thinking about it is really rather unique. What I remember about this interview, and I, I, I agree with you, Maybe some answers would be a bit different, but this kind of very strong strain of a moral compass in all of his answers, that there's a kind of a moral dimension to his answer that I remember I found deeply moving. So I really, I'm really happy we get to share this today with our listeners. I also want to remind people uh, they can find more about us. So your Instagram, if you want to tell us what it is, mine is Uli NYC. It's U-L-I-N-Y-C. And the podcast has a website, of course, the postquestionnaire.net or post.questionnaire on Instagram. Yes. And my uh, Instagram is Caroline Weber 2020, all one word, but the 2020 is numerals. I have been unsuccessful in persuading my husband to come onto Instagram, uh, but he is uh, quite active, I believe, on Twitter, uh, Paul M. Romer. And yeah, it will be fun to hear this interview again and uh, where I really did learn some things about my own husband. So that was also an unusual uh, effect of our uh, decision to have him on the podcast, but one that I uh, was really, really moving to me as well and, and really enjoyable. So um, welcome. Caroline and I are here today. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> uh, hi, yeah. 
Oh, I know you. That's my husband. <laughs> Paul Roma is Caroline's husband. So thank you, Paul, uh, yeah. for joining us on the Proust question today. Uh, it's great to be here. So let's just jump right in. And um, Doesn't that sound like the thing everybody says? Oh, it's great to be here. Uh, no, I'm, I'm we'll looking, find I'm, out. I'm looking forward. To we'll find out. That. Exactly. The first question is an easy one. Um, what is your idea of perfect happiness? That's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have come to think that perfect happiness is something that comes in little bursts. It's like bursty. So you go through periods of frustration, 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 and then you get it right. And that's, I think, that moment of, of perfect happiness. Okay. Um, second question is, what is your greatest fear? Oh, 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 let, me give you, let me give you an example. I, this is what I <laughs> interpret when people say they really like golf. Because they spend a lot of time talking about how frustrating it is, but occasionally they hit it. And for me right now, it's like computer code. It's like, you know, you try it, it doesn't work, you try it, it doesn't work, you try it, you try it, and then finally, ah, it works. And you're like, you've got a website. And so, you know, that's in a, a small scale. But I think most of life is like that. You spend a lot of time trying and aiming for it, and then you got to savor it when it comes. Um, what is your greatest fear? <laughs> It's that I might not take full advantage of opportunities that are just given to me, unearned. And you know, I feel like the, the obligation is somehow when it's not earned and you're just given you know, good fortune and uh, you, you benefit from circumstances, then I think you have an obligation to do something important with it. And I, I worry a lot about... I think not living up to what I feel like have been just a terrific set of opportunities that I've gotten. Uh, what, like what opportunities specifically? Well, I mean, you lived through some of this. Um, there was a lot of discussion about, I, like for, like for back in the 90s, people were talking about me winning the Nobel Prize. So I got used to hearing this discussion all the time. And there was one particular time when I thought it was, you know, uh, imminent. And... Um, I was very worried that I wouldn't somehow take advantage of the, you know, the opportunity that would be presented in getting the prize. Fortunately, um, I didn't get it that year. <laughs> but then, you know, after I thought it would never happen, then I did get it. And so then I didn't have any, you know, angst about how would I be prepared for it. So I just had to wing it, which is mostly how I approach life. So, uh, but I always worry that if you're always winging it, you might miss the chance to do something. If you'd planned it, you could have done uh, an even better job. This may or may not be related to what you've just been talking about. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Not what is the trait I most deplore in you. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> Let me count the ways. <laughs> well, this is not the couples therapy, uh, right. so let's just focus on Paul. <laughs> uh, um, I, I really don't like the degree to which I'm a little bit disorganized and a little bit behind the curve. And, and that I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit dyslexic, so I make spelling mistakes. I think this is all a package where I feel like I'm just not quite, you know, just don't quite have it together. And I, I find that embarrassing and frustrating. Oh. Um, what is the trait you most deplore in others and not in me? Again, yeah. uh, Uli. <laughs> Um, I think there's a, a, a trait of a sense of superiority that I find just deeply um, uh, un unsettling and aversive, and I really object to it. And then I think, I think what, it, what I mean by that is it's like when someone feels like they don't even have to take the trouble to have some empathy for somebody else. You know, people have different skills, different levels of achievement, so all kinds of different ways that you could rank people. But um, there's still some sense that this is another human and I have some obligation to have a little bit of empathy and care about what's that person's experience, at least be interested in what that person's experience of life and the world is like. And I think there are some people who feel 
superior in the sense that they don't have to bother to form any kind of empathetic kind of connection to another person. And I, I, I just really makes me angry when I, when I see that. Which living person do you most admire? Hmm. Can I give more than one answer? Sure. sure. Um, I, I'm very impressed with two people I don't – well, actually, all these are people I don't know particularly well. But I think um, Mike Bloomberg and Nandan Nilankani are the two people I know who had very successful business careers and then very successful careers in the public sector. It's a very unusual combination because most people are really good and the private sector can't – transfer that success to the public sector. But, um, you know, Mike obviously was the mayor and then built Bloomberg. Nandan worked at um, Infosys, which is a big successful tech company in India, then ran this amazing project that a lot of people don't know about called um, the, the Universal ID or the Adhar number that gave a billion Indians the chance to be official to have an official uh, identity. I mean, some of them already had birth certificates, but a lot of people didn't. And um, that he was able to do that at that kind of scale um, through the government, I thought was was astonishing. So those are two people I admire uh, a, a great deal because of the diversity of their achievements. Right. Um, the other person I admire a lot was um, Barack Obama because of his um, his discipline. And in a way, I think it's a kind of like the mirror image of what I don't have. I'm not disciplined in the same way. I'm not organized. I don't stay on message. But the discipline I think he showed in uh, presenting himself as the first black president of the United States and the discipline he showed about kind of trying to be the president of everyone in the United States and be a role model but not to fall into some of the conventional traps about, you know, pandering and, you know, catering. And um, I, I thought that – and, and you could see times when it was just so difficult for him given the, the, the flack he was taking, often from like, like blacks and people in the Democratic Party. And, and I, thought, I thought it was an astonishing display of, of you know, discipline and, and a large degree of self-sacrifice, doing what was right even when it is hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, what is your greatest extravagance? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that's clear. Um, I, uh, I bought an airplane and uh, kept it for many years. When I moved to New York, I found it was a lot tougher to keep flying it. And so I eventually sold it because flying is something you either do a lot or not at all. But um, – it was really extravagant to be able to go out in a in a, in a private plane and fly at, in the West where I was um, where I was flying. But it um, there was a kind of st state that isn't perfect happiness, but it's like flow that I could get into when I was flying, and I could go about four hours on a full tank of gas, and it was like the only four hour stretch I think I experienced it in in my life then where. I wasn't thinking about the things I need to do next week or tomorrow. I wasn't thinking about the things I screwed up yesterday. It's like four hours of, you know, just in exactly in the moment, you know, like gauge motion, you know, appreciation. It's just like four hours in the moment. And um, it, was a, it was a very valuable thing, but it was a little bit uh, extravagant way to get it. Um. What, since you've now sold the plane, uh, maybe flow yeah. state won't be your answer, but um, what is your current state of mind? Right now? Yeah. Oh, a little bit of anxiety and um, some, some engagement, but anxiety is like, I mean, think of all the things I could say that could go wrong in this context. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, this, is, this is not a school exam. Oh, oh I know. I'm actually, not worried about you. You can <laughs> test. You yeah. can, but you, you, you're afraid but, you could fail this on some <laughs> level. <laughs> somebody, somebody took a quick look and said, Paul, there's a question on here about the love of your life. It's like, oh, oh okay. All oh, right. no. Prepare yeah. for that one. It's that coming up. Like, just, oh, really? just be aware. Wait, that, who looked at that? <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, the guy who works with Paul. Yeah. All right. But no, but I think we'll, we'll have to have a conversation mm. about that. Because one thing I did want to say at the beginning, all joking aside about us being married, is the fact that um, 
I'm really happy to get to have this kind of conversation with you. If I weren't married to you, I wouldn't be able to sit down with an economist of your stature. And um, so I, I think there are plenty of right. answers that you can provide and plenty of subjects we can touch on that have nothing to do with me. Yeah, well, um, I, hope, I hope actually some of these surprise you a little bit. Yeah. You know, maybe, oh, yeah. No, I think so. so. It's actually the virtue of this questionnaire that no matter how much you think you prepare for it, yeah. It draws out something authentic. Right. Yeah, to use that word that yeah. Sartre told us doesn't really work that yeah. well, but there's something it actually draws out, yeah. and it's not salacious or sensational. It's actually deep in a way. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I bet so, I, I bet it'll surprise me. Yeah. 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 Um, next question is: What do you consider the most overrated virtue? Hmm. So I'm not I'm not even sure kind of like what's the reference set you know I like it's sort is, of is what like, the, like would like would what the public beauty, values like would beauty be yes. perceived as a future, future? I think so I, I think I think I think beauty is o- overrated okay. um uh, because it's it it fades and it it doesn't always you know typically doesn't connect with the like the deeper qualities mm-hmm. so and um I also think I I'm a little bit Underdeveloped in terms of my ascent, my sense of appreciation of many kind of aesthetic, just mm-hmm. visual um, um, characteristics as well. So, so it's not all uh, a sign of virtue that I'm right. <laughs> dismissive of beauty. I think I, I should learn to appreciate. There are things like natural beauty, like the vistas in the West when I was flying right. with clear air, and you could just see for you know like forty miles. I, I really appreciated the natural beauty, but I, I'm not. I don't have as developed a sense of like painting, sculpture. Um, um, so, uh, so you know, it's it's like underrated means that there's a chance for me to go go learn more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, I like this question because I think I know what you'll say, maybe. But mm-hmm. on what occasion do you lie? Hmm. I I really try not to lie, and I'm I'm yeah I'm not I'm not good at it, and even to a fault. There are some times when a little bit of a you know like a convenient fiction or a kind of an implicit understanding is is part of you know the kind of the the, the way to ease uh, social interaction. Um, so. Um, Well, and actually, I was thinking one one other case, which is, um, I mean, think about, listen to me as I say two things. I mean, one is, oh, that's a really good effort. That was a good idea. I think it's great <laughs> that you did that. And then the other is, I think you're wrong. Here's why. You got a mistake here. You neglected that. Now, who am I talking to in those two cases? In the first case, it's somebody I'm thinking I need to counsel out of a PhD program because they're not going to make it, and that's a little bit of a lie. When I thought, oh, that's that was a great try, and mm-hmm. and but the converse of the, the the person I can say to you're wrong, and here's why. That's somebody who I really respect. It's a peer. Yeah. It's a peer, yeah. yeah. And I know that you know they will appreciate the direct feedback. And uh. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what do you most dislike about your appearance? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wish I uh, hadn't gained weight in the last, you know, three years. You know, so, uh, you know, that was one of the consequences of going to the bank. I really gained weight when I went to the World Bank um, and was away. Did they have from, a lot of lunches with good food there or something? No, no, no. It was, <laughs> it's just a lot of work. No, uh, no yeah. No, I was just being like, away from, you know, and being lonely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. Finding, finding solace in a... And a half pint of ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> I, th- yeah. The ice cream consumption yeah. went yeah. way up. Yeah. But you know, yeah. I love your appearance. Yeah. So, so handsome. You're, you're, we're on a podcast, so you can't see, but he's very handsome. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. living person do you most despise? I mean, we got, you know, Neil Akani and Bloomberg and Obama as the ones you admire. But who do you most despise right now? You know, I think I think it's a bad habit to let yourself despise somebody. Mm. So I, I, I really try to think of the the human side and, and kind of empathize. Empathize doesn't mean, you know, be sympathetic 
with or support, but but still trying to understand what's it like to be that that person. Mm -hmm. So I can get very angry with somebody, but yet still I try not to, you know, go to lose the capacity to understand, like, how did this person end up being who they are mm -hmm. and acting the way mm -hmm. they, they do? So that's an indulgence I don't, I think I don't <laughs> think I should allow myself. Mm. Although, oh, well, but, but now <laughs> having said that, but, but there is a little bit of like, kind of like faux, you know, animosity. So like, um, you know, like some people this way about like the other sports team, you know, right. like the Red Sox or the Yankees or something. And so, so in rock and roll, I can really go on about like who really mattered for uh, like bringing like <laughs> country into rock and, and who didn't matter. And um, this is an ongoing conversation at, at, at home and about whether Graham, mm -hmm. Graham Parsons or Clarence White. But, you know, anyway, so I can I can generate a sort of a head of steam about that. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of all in right. all in play. Yeah, good fun. What is the quality you most like in a man? Well, I think I think integrity um, is something that I, I really admire, and integrity both in the sense of you know a certain kind of honesty and transparency, but also a, an authenticity or you know the wholeness of it. It isn't just an occasional thing or a, a sort of something that you you put on like clothing. It's just an automatic part of um, the way you, you go through the world. Not a transactional thing, not yeah, behavior right. to it's achieve not, results. It's not because you're going to get something right. when you get to heaven or because people are going to like you or it's right. just it's just it's just what you do. Okay. Yeah. The next question is the same, but what is the quality you most like in a woman? Hmm. Oh, I think I think it's really the same. I, I think that that integrity is 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 very important, mm -hmm. and you know, I may I honestly may underestimate the value of any conversation between two people is at both the level of sort of like conscious, you know, language processing, and emotional kind of signaling, and I think I when I think of integrity, I may put a little too much weight on the conscious communication, and forget that there may be ways to just shade a little bit the the conscious communication mm -hmm. to reinforce a, a, an authentic kind of emotional mm -hmm. um, connection. So I may sometimes be a little kind of like <sighs> rigid about this, but uh, I, I think I think that kind of in integrity is um, is admirable. And I think it's also something that I like to be around because then you can really trust people and being with people you trust is, is really a, a remarkably powerful kind of feeling and experience. Which words or phrases do you most overuse? <laughs> Integrity. <laughs> uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, um, I, I, I use that a lot. Uh, I've learned to be careful about and, you know, I you know I, I made this big deal about overuse of and and writing at the bank and the so, World Bank, yeah, World Bank, yeah, and then people now you know I, I I made this kind of joke about setting you know the frequency of the word and couldn't exceed two point three percent or I was gonna not I was not gonna sign off on the document <laughs> and, and like I, I really enforced that people like were checking and then we had this argument about well did the footnotes count do the references count but but so now people will check my blogs or my you know emails and tell me oh you know you're at like two point five Ball, uh, so, so I'm careful about and, but um, I'm sure there's there's something in addition to um that I use too often. All right, this question um, because Daniel, who you work with, uh, pointed out this yep. question to you ahead of time. But I think there's another answer that I would think of for you that I would rather hear you say um, than including me in this. <laughs> what or who is the greatest love of your life? Uh, so do you want to do you want to bracket me out and just pretend like I'm a I'm not your wife. So, well, yeah. the, the answer is you're the love of my life, of course. But then if Sweet. the question is, well, after me or in addition, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think this is what you're expecting. And I, I hope this doesn't make me seem weird. But um, we, have a, a, we have a dog, one of our four dogs, uh, Penny, who I'm just smitten with. And it was yeah. because of that experience of holding her when she was so little 
and so dependent. Yeah. And um, that uh, I, I just have this very close uh, close bond with, with her. And it, it is – it's interesting. You know, I was saying I don't pay as much attention to the emotional part because I'm always like at the – Conscious communication, Cerebral. you know. I've tried to tell Penny about what I'm doing at work, but you know, it doesn't really <laughs> seem to connect. So she doesn't, uh, is not impressed. Yeah, she's not, she's not impressed. impressed. So, um, so then you know, I gotta I have to investigate or invest in the kind of the more emotional uh, connection. <laughs> and, uh, I used to say when I got frustrated, uh, especially like when I was dealing with a bunch of complicated interpersonal issues at the at the bank. Um, that I used to say that the, the dogs keep me human. And there's a sense in which dogs <laughs> really do watch emotional signals from people and body language, and they really do kind of connect pretty effectively at that, that emotional level. Um, when and where were you happiest? You know, it's interesting. Uh, there's another episode. I don't know if you mean when, like what era or what, like half a minute. But um, I used to come home from Stanford and we had another puppy, the the black lab, Jamie, that you, you've heard about. I remember coming home from, you know, whatever were the stresses of the moment and just sitting in the backyard and holding Jamie as a puppy in, in my arms and um, – There's something about the warmth and that connection, that 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 emotional connection that I found like very reassuring and kind of and kind of calming too. I, you know, you don't have to think about like what else is going on. It's maybe it's maybe like like the flying. You, mm -hmm. you quiet the conscious thought and you just kind of are in the moment with mm -hmm. the the feeling. So something you can hold as a small creature uh, that's dependent on you is. Um, It was a very good way to uh, to be happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which talent would you most like to have? Mm. Assuming you don't have all the talent, right? No, which we're assuming you need, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I like the idea that I can still invest in new things. So you know, I just um, I just spent some time with some some new photography equipment and tried to take take pictures. I think that would be a fun talent to uh, develop, partly because I do love uh, the, the sort of the landscape, the outdoors, and uh, want to try and capture that. Mm. Here's my quick take on that, by the way. The camera can never capture what the eye sees. You can get close, but it's just never the same. Um, I spend a, a, a little bit of time and energy, including like a trip to Hawaii with my daughter um, because I wanted to learn to kite surf. Mm -hmm. And I just never, I never got to the point where I could kind of get up, get up on the board. I could fly the kite, but the kind of the next stage getting up on the board, I didn't make it. So that was one I just, I had to give up on. Mm -hmm. uh, but it looked, it just looks so amazing to watch people where they, you, you increase the lift on the kite and then you just kind of go up in the air. You know, it's just this, amazing. they're zooming across the water and then they pop up in yeah, the air and jump over. It's absolutely That's, terrifying. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I, I just thought, uh, you, you know, like that, to what, fly. what could I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and in a similar vein, I, I wish I were a, a good musician. Uh, but I think anybody can become a musician, but it, you know, it competes in terms of time. And so I was in, I was the bass player. And you know, if you're the bass player, you weren't as good as the one who got to be the lead player. You know? But I, I <laughs> um, for one summer, I was bass player in a you know a garage band. But I um, I wish I wish I could entertain myself with you know kind of a little bit of you know, playing on the on the guitar. And, and right now I'm sort of rusty enough that it isn't even entertaining to <laughs> try and entertain I mean, myself. For yourself, right? Yeah. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Well, there's some there's some that are kind of like jokey, like oh, I'd really like it if I didn't need to sleep. <laughs> like just think about how much extra time you you could have if you could do that. But um, more and more seriously, or what, or pragmatically, um, I, I wish I had better social skills. Actually, I, I'm I'm a bit of an like more than a bit of an introvert, 
And, uh, you know, and, and I think one can learn this, but if I put my mind to it, I could get her again. Caroline, you've, you've really actually helped me with this in some ways. Um, even if you're an introvert, you can still learn to be out in public, as, you know, as we've discussed. Um, so I'd like to um, be a little bit more comfortable in social situations. I mean, I think the fact that I sometimes retreat to holding, you know, a puppy is a, kind of a sign that I I feel a little, you know, out of place. In, in or a, flying at a... More flying, yeah. Now, <laughs> by the way, like, oh, no, never that high. The view's better. But, um, but no, the, the, these flights were like me and the plane. <laughs> it was like there was nobody in the okay. in the right seat. Yeah. Um, what do you consider your greatest achievement? Yeah, that, that, that I've thought about before. I, the thing I'm really proud of is that I crafted a model of economic growth that people thought was innovative. I think it was innovative for the time, and it was on a topic that economists weren't working on in my PhD thesis. But there was something about it where I just felt just a tiny bit uncomfortable. I just didn't think it quite cohered. And this is this is not just a question of like how does it apply to the real world. This is like the logical consistency. Mm -hmm. you, you want you put all these different things together, and they, they've got to be logically consistent. Like they can't be inconsistent with each other. But actually, the next it was logically consistent, but there's another dimension which is like you want it to be um, robust. So that if you don't want it, so that if you just tweak one part of it just a tiny bit, like the whole thing falls apart because you know the world isn't isn't like that. But I concluded after, um, shortly after I submitted my thesis, that it was actually wrong and the model was wrong. And then I came up with version two, wrong in the sense that it was, it relied on something which um, just couldn't, I couldn't justify logically and it was kind of created a kind of non-robustness about it. So I, what I like best is that I rejected the first model I proposed and then uh, came up with, with an alternative. and. Um, I think there are other times, not maybe as big as that one, but I think it's a very important part of being a scientist to be good at saying, okay, I was wrong on that. I, I believed it. I argued for it. But I've listened. I, I, was, I was wrong. Because I, I think the way science makes progress is when many voices and intellects kind of converse, discuss, uh, dispute, and then out of that comes a kind of consensus. And to make that work, you always have to be willing to respect the consensus more than you cling to your own mm -hmm. kind of like egotism of, of your own view. And so, so I think that capacity to see that, okay, I did that and, you know, it's fine to do it, but there's an improvement, there's a better way, there's an alternative. Um, I, I'm, I'm more proud of that than anything else I, I, I did in my career. But it takes a commitment to the idea rather than your own mm -hmm. mastery mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, and even it's, it's almost like a commitment to the process, yeah. you know, um, rather than any, like, one particular, you know, thing, way station or marker, milestone in, in this journey towards a better understanding mm -hmm. of the, the world. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, if you were to die and come back as another person or a thing, or maybe an animal, mm -hmm. uh, what would it be? What well, can it be? A, a, a person? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, a person. Um, so I, I've thought many times that if I had it to do over again, I'd be interested in going into computer engineering and mm -hmm. computer science. Since I've been teaching myself um, uh, Python, I, I've actually, I feel like I've been able to kind of simulate that to, to some extent. But I felt like there was a world there that I just wanted to know to know more about. So there was a, there was a period of time where I thought, you know, if I came back, I'd want to be a, you know, a computer uh, uh, programmer, engineer, uh, um, instead, of, instead of an economist. Um, where would you most like to live? <laughs> Oh, well, that's, unfortunately, um, I'd really like to live someplace where there aren't any ticks. <laughs> no ticks. <laughs> yeah, we have four dogs, you know, so no and, ticks. and ticks can carry some really nasty diseases. Are there diseases. places without ticks? You have to go, It's got they got to be cold for okay. part of the year or the ticks 
because if it really gets cold, the ticks can't survive. Okay. You know, I, even Colorado, where I'm from, they have some ticks that spread Rocky Mountain fever. But I've become a little bit obsessed with with ticks. So, <laughs> okay. um, but um, we'll but, include a map. Yeah. In, the, in the in the notes to the podcast, with the tick tick free zone, probably <laughs> yeah. something above the Canada, sort of northern Canada or something. Yeah, yeah. I won't I won't say where, but uh, Carol and I, it, it's a real issue when you, and also like some place you can get to if you're trying to take four dogs, one of whom weighs 110 pounds. So you know, yeah. it's a little bit logistically complicated. So we had this place. We thought, oh, this would be great. And then I looked it up, and this was like this has the highest incidence of Lyme disease oh, of okay. all of New England. And okay. so, okay, no, that's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, in our existing country house, we've had many a, a sort of a tick sighting and tick scare, so we don't yeah. get up there yeah. as much because it's it's worrisome. Um, what is your most treasured possession? Hmm. Well, there are some pictures um, that I still have in a like a physical form, mm-hmm. especially pictures of my kids that. Um, I, I really, I really treasure. There's a, I can create a feeling by looking at those pictures. That's just really wonderful. So, I, I could, I could sort of let go of pretty much everything, everything else, everything else inanimate. The, you know, the dogs, the people I know, of course, are you know very special too. But in uh, among uh, inanimate objects, pretty much everything else is, uh, I think, you know, replaceable except those those pictures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? I think being in a circumstance where you have to compromise your principles about what's right and wrong. And um, because of the power relationship, um, do something that you really think is wrong. I, that That just seems like misery to me. Um, and I think one of the things I've noticed about my own career and, and also my father's when I've looked at it is that at least in the circumstances that we've experienced because um, look there's other circumstances like people in war zones and violence so things can be much worse but in, in, in the United States growing up there's always something else you can go do. You know you can hit a wall where the your position and the power structures and such are that you really would have to compromise to keep going. And, you know, I, I think the answer then is, okay, we'll go do something else. There's always something else you can go do. So uh, um, then I think it's, it's, a, it's the way to avoid that misery is just never get, never get so attached to the path you're on that you're not ready to, to switch if, mm-hmm. if things uh, present you with that kind of a dilemma. What is or what would be your favorite occupation if it were not being an economist? <laughs> But you could say an economist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the life of, of of an academic is really a, a very rewarding one, and um, and I think it um, and in ways that I you know I think I have to try and consciously get myself to pay attention to. Um, like it's it, it's really. Re- relaxing and productive to be amongst people you can generally trust, and and you can generally trust them even be, even when you don't like them or they don't like you. You know the the systems in in academics and especially in science are such that people are at great risk if they get caught like just lying, cheating, making up data, and so you know even when you don't necessarily have a close emotional bond. You can still trust that what they're saying. I mean, you, you verify, but you can generally trust what they tell you is true, and um, that's a that's a great environment in which to work. And I also think that being feeling like you're part of something which has some, you know, larger purpose mm-hmm. and that will kind of continue when you're gone. I think that's also um, a good way to you know contemplate our you know our own mortality. So um, so I think. The academic life can be um, can be rewarding. Now, now in truth, um, there was a time when I just basically gave up entirely on being an economist and I stopped publishing papers. I went out and did a, a, a software startup. Um, so you know, like it, it can be a rocky road. I shouldn't I shouldn't over oversell it. But um, but it's still in the right circumstances. It can be a very um, 
very good career. What is your most marked characteristic? And I think that means what do other people perceive of you first? Mm -hmm. And different people will see different things. So I got to try and think about, like, oh, what's the... the what, does Penny, the what does Penny see in the morning when she sees <laughs> you? Probably the most, the truest yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's hard to predict what he's going to do, you know? He's, he's a little bit, you know, unpredictable, I think. She's always watching carefully. It's like, okay, like, what now, what now, you know? Um, uh, I think... I think there's a, a menu of things. One is a certain kind of naivete, which can be, you know, you can look at it in a positive or in a negative way. But I think partly just like in this environment where you can kind of trust people, I, I tend to be trusting and kind of naive. Um, um, you know, I used to be sort of decidedly optimistic and you know, I'm a little bit less of that these days, and I don't know if that's like age related or you know <laughs> circumstantial, but um, so naive, I mean, generally optimistic, um, and you know distractible. I you know I can get interested in all kinds of different things, and I think it works to my benefit because I you know I can sometimes grab something over here and something over here and either mash them together or find an abstraction that, that links the two. But um, this kind of almost like vacuum cleaner-like distractibility. Okay, what's this? You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like, I, I kind of, it's like with the dogs. It's like, then they, the news, oh, what's this? What's this? Who's this? What's this smell? What's this smell? You know, so, <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it uh, that that probably shows through on Bali. What do you most value in your friends? I think I think there's a combination of both kind of acceptance of who I am and acceptance of who they are that um, is is a little bit rare, but that's the kind of the ideal um, because then you don't have to worry about is you know is anybody gonna like step on a, a sore point with the other and you can just kind of you can kind of relax. Mm -hmm. I, I think a good sign of that kind of that kind of relationship is when. You can do something like you're in a car trip or something else where you go for long stretches of time with no no conversation or even sometimes like this interrupted conversation. It's just like this is a long period of time and yeah, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> and then another like five minutes. Of, <laughs> Who are your favorite writers if you have any? Yeah. Um, I I was so this is just a, this is kind of this more this emotional level. What did I just really love and get into? I loved uh, this book, um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, mm -hmm. by um, Jean Le Carre, um, and um, um, I also loved. And I think this is a little bit like more lowbrow, but I loved Lonesome Dove too. Oh really? This mm -hmm. kind of you know this cowboy uh, epic. Not the I I think I tried watching a screen version of it. And didn't didn't connect at all. But um. But Lonesome Dove um, was good. There's, there's a kind of a connection to the West. I, I recently listened to a, um, an audio book of um, uh, True Grit, which, you know, has been made into a movie a couple times. But it's the story. It's, it's, you think it's the story of a 14-year-old girl telling you about her adventures trying to avenge the death of her father. But um, you later start to realize that it's the story told by a much older woman who's remembering what it was like when she was 14 and went through this experience. But um, there's a voice of this girl from Arkansas, which is really very, very distinctive and true grit, that also made that a, like a recent kind of fun, fun discovery. Mm -hmm. Who is your, so the original Proust questionnaire asks, who is your hero of fiction? But Uli and I have expanded that to include television and film. Who mm. is your hero of fiction, television, or film? Mm. The fine Hebrew. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know who I enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I enjoy uh, kind of watching on TV. Um, is this this character uh, Raylan Givens? 
who was the central character in the TV show Justified, but he came out of stories by um, Elmore Leonard. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is really, I think, a very rich um, character. Yeah, and um, so um, he's not... He's kind of like the flawed, you know, hero, or maybe even kind of anti-hero. But, uh, but I, I enjoy, I, I enjoy watching. Uh, what specifically watching. do you love about him? I know that you love him, and yeah, I love him with yeah, you. But yeah. I, it'll be, it would be interesting to know for I, people who don't know you yeah, why you love him. Well, I, I, you know, I have trouble connecting with anger, and I, I suppress it. I often don't know that it's there. It, it's, it's not a good trait, you know. You, you at least ought to know it's there. But, but. Raylan, you know, there's a in the in the pilot. There's a point where his wife says, um, "I know you hide it." Uh, he, says, he says, "Oh, you know, I never thought of myself as an angry man." And his wife said, "I know you hide it, and uh, you may not see it, but Raylan, you're the angriest man I've ever known." And and I kind of you know somehow kind of resonate with that that kind of difficulty about even mm. connecting with and somehow knowing how to channel anger uh, about you know generally about. A kind of injustice. Um, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I probably anger about other things, too. Which historical figure do you most identify with? I, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with William Penn. You know? Okay. So um, I, I think he pulled off something really quite remarkable when he uh, created this new, you know, uh, what was then? It was his dominion, and so he wrote the Charter, which was what they referred to as a constitution. And it was apparently the first constitution that had a provision for amendment. Uh, that, but, um, but what was distinctive was his uh, success in building a community where people believed in and supported the separation of church and state. Right. And he did this not just because he was a Quaker and recruiting, recruiting Quakers, and not just because of the document, but he recruited lots of different kind of basically mostly Protestant dissidents from various parts of Europe to come live in Pennsylvania. And uh, that selection of people who all believed firmly in the importance of separation of church and state meant that this new foreign idea really took root and, mm-hmm. and persisted. Uh, so I, I think... It was an amazing thing to have um, to pull to have pulled off. Maryland had something in their charter or constitution that assured this as well, but they didn't go through that same process of like selecting, recruiting in people who really believed in it. So it, it didn't. It, it was very. It was touch and go for a long time and about whether you, there truly was, you know, religious freedom and separation right. of church and state in Maryland. Right. So. Who are your heroes in real life, apart from William Penn? Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned I mentioned these people who um, like had served both in, had achieved success in both business and the mm-hmm. and the public sector. Um, I guess I, I tend to look at something like you know a, a accomplishment and. Um, as a younger man, I, I was very, very taken with Albert Einstein um, hmm. uh, because there is something just kind of heroic about this this leap he made into understanding um, the world, the universe. Um, I'm, I'm more and more inclined to believe that there's something dangerous about that model. I, I think that most knowledge accrues through trial and error and uh, through kind of more inductive, empirically based. And it's very rare that someone can make this insight like through pure reasoning that is so fertile. But early in my career, so Newton to the same extent. I mean, Newton's unification of the thing that makes the moon go around the earth is the same as the thing that makes the apple fall. I mean, like who to thunk those had anything to do with each other, and uh, but he could do this with just a little bit of math. I, I think that was really uh, quite quite impressive, and and Newton was in that. that I'm sorry, Einstein was in that same vein, but um, I mean these days I, I'm impressed with almost like communities that are able to learn through trial and error, and and also more impressed that most of what humans know is like 
stored in a distributed fashion. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all of the people around us who actually know bits of what we actually end up using. So that's the kind of, the, I think, the polar opposite to this kind of individual, you know, insight. Right. What are your favorite names? Oh. Hmm. Oh. So what what is it on the game show? Like, can I get like a can I get a, a lifeline? A lifeline, yeah. Can I get somebody. a lifeline on that one? I, I don't. Hey, nothing comes to mind. I'll I'll come back to it if something yeah. springs yeah. up. But um, what is it that you yeah. most dislike? Um, to not so we've talked about it in people, but this would be it'd be anything really. I mean, ticks. We do know you don't yeah. know ticks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think the you know the the, the <laughs> risk of I think the risk of this is something that's kind of I think, like psychologists, you know, evolutionary psychologists have paid attention to that the risk of infection. You know, this is a very important thing that humans were exposed to. So there are certain kind of things where you have a a disgust or kind of fear reaction, and and so I think I. I do, um, yeah, I do have a mm -hmm. kind of reaction to that. So, and so ticks is these vectors for, you know, for disease. Right. Um, and I guess partly because it also suggests something about the kind of fragility of some kind of complicated system like, a, like the body, right. you know, that it can work amazingly well and it can, you know, adjust to shocks and heal itself. But there are some things that can just knock it into a... Um, a bad state that's very hard to recover mm -hmm. from. So that that seems frightening to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, and one other thing, duck's feet. You know, every time they ask me, well, do you have any food restrictions or allergies? And it's like, yeah, I mean, I'm not allergic to them, but I, I don't like eating duck's feet. Okay. And, and you know, you, I, don't, I don't know if I told you this, but you wouldn't think that's an issue you'd have to confront very often. In some cultures like, you do. Well, once <laughs> once long ago, I was present, presented with it and said, oh, God, that's not good. But um, just on a recent trip to China, you know, at the restaurant, lo and behold, it was duck's feet again. So I'm sorry. I'm going to take a pass on that one. And, you know, it's, it's not polite. You're supposed to taste everything. But I just, <laughs> I'm just not good with duck's feet. <laughs> what is your greatest regret? There were times when I didn't stick to my guns and um, also didn't have enough confidence in myself. So I... You mean professionally? Professionally, or, yeah. yeah. Where I kind of, I think, gave in. And, and it's hard to know. Some of this might be just a realism about, like, this isn't the time. You know, don't, you're not going to win that fight, so don't, don't try. But um, I do have some regret about, you know, and... I worry in retrospect whether I was not um, assertive enough in standing up for kind of what I what I believed in on, on just a kind of professional issues. It's linked to this idea of integrity or yep. sort of, yeah. Um, next question is, how would you like to die? <laughs> My my first wife was a, an MD, and my daughter's now an MD. And amongst MDs, they they have a they have a pretty clear answer to this. So I'll just borrow what they say: is heart attack. You know, just have a heart attack, just die quickly, and then it's quick, simple, clean, and you know, that's that's all uh, all it really takes. Okay. Um, but the other thing is, um, I've I've had this experience now with, with dogs about kind of managing in the end-of-life situation. And I think one of the characteristics of how you die that you, you should think about is it will leave, you know, feelings for those who, who live on. Mm -hmm. And you want to die in a way where you don't leave people with some burden of shame or regret mm -hmm. or... Um, mm -hmm. So if I, you can kind of do it in a way... You know, like with the with Jamie, this, this puppy I used to hold out in California... Um, I, I ended up, um, he got to the point where he couldn't walk and mm -hmm. it was really painful to, to see. And so I, I went, I went to the vet and, um, and, you know, they put him to sleep and it was really like him going to sleep, but it was, it was really kind of reassuring to be there with him and see that he, uh, he wasn't suffering and he wasn't frightened and, 
and that that memory is 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 important. What is your motto? Oh, I, I mean, it'll this these vary uh, over time, but I, I think I, I I just had one recently for people. Um, I don't have to think about this. Um, you know, you know how when you you think, oh, I might not remember this, and then you can't remember it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm I'm blocking on this, but I had a motto just that I, but it was kind of these are kind of uh, situational, but. Uh, um, I'm not going to come back to the names thing, but I, I will. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to think Simply of what was, okay. what was I saying? What was I saying is my my model. Um, I mean, there, there's a there's a, there's a few. One that I kind of emulated, I, I like from another group was a group of engineers where um, that worked on. It was basically the people who designed the Internet Protocol, and um, um, the, the, the 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 basic their motto was rough consensus working code. You know, they didn't force everybody to agree huh. and they wouldn't get caught up in these kind of hypotheticals is like, we're going to get a rough consensus and then you show us working code and then boom. That's, uh, um, I like that's, that. Um, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's actually a good way to do a it's lot a of things. It's a good one for political activism too. Yeah. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah to yeah. get organized in a group that has a lot of different opinions. Yeah. Rough consensus. Yeah. Rough consensus. Not yeah. full yeah. consensus. Yeah. 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 Working code. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's part of characteristic of science, too. When I was saying you have a consensus, yeah, I know there's always some people who right. kind of are kind of cranky and disagreeable and might not join in. But so rough consensus is really all it takes. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to – there was one I'm fishing for, and it may it may come back to me. So okay. I'll, 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 well, sure. Paul, you actually gave us um, an idea for a question we add to this oh, okay. questionnaire, which is who would you like to see – do this podcast and answer this set of questions. Who is oh, the person yeah. you would find interesting to listen to? Oh, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Who? I'm. You're gonna have. Um, well, gonna, Mike Bloomberg, Barack Obama. <laughs> oh no, no, no! But there's, there's actually somebody else. Um, um, <laughs> the, the actor who was um, in like Princess Bride, but then also Mandy the, Patinkin. Mandy Patinkin. Yeah, I don't know oh. why. Mandy just seems like a, a, an interesting guy and. <laughs> And it might be that if somebody isn't, like, writing the script, he's not interesting. But he looks to me like he'd be an interesting guy. Okay. And then, actually, I've, I've read just a little bit about him and, you know, his somewhat prickly, you know, character. And I, I bet he's kind of opinionated in ways that would be fun to fun to hear. So right. well, I don't know why, but, I, you know, of, of the various, like, you know, people you don't know but you'd, you'd like to get to know, he, he, he strikes me as one. Um, there's some other – People I know who would be good, but um, but that, that's not the same kind of uh, kind of personal interest. Mm-hmm. As I like I, I'd like to uh, I'd like to hear it, but um, um, oh man, I, I may have to like mail in the uh, mail in the the, the motto. I, I think it actually came up this this weekend, oh, okay. so I, I I'm not I am. Um, um, when does this when does your podcast go live? We'll give you some time to think about it. Not right away. No, but, yeah. but like when, when do you think you'll you'll actually go? Probably the end of September. So in about well, oh, okay. in about three about weeks month, or so. Yeah. so oh, yeah. Okay. So well, then I can months. then I can disclose something that won't come out until until later, which is I, and that Caroline knows, which is I just visited Burning Man. Oh, right. Because there's this it's, there's two things there. There's an event, which gets a lot of attention, but there's a city. They call it Black Rock City. They build a city from nothing right. in about three weeks. So I saw it on August 1st when it was just like flat desert. So it's and like then, a charter city. Well, or, or, just, you, or just like on. any kind of – because yeah. I'm so right. keen on cities as these amazing human creations that um, this one's interesting just because it, it, it can be built so quickly. And it also – it's like the Groundhog Day version of a city. They do it every year so they can make some some small changes. Mm-hmm. So I think there was some motto I, I had this this weekend that was kind of like, you know, abstracting. Uh, I hope it's something like build it and leave no trace or something like because it's in the West and yeah. it's supposed to respect. Well, that's, the well, that's actually you know yeah. that that you know that is very much right. a part of their their commitment. But um, but it was actually something a little bit more more general. But uh, anyway, uh-huh. if I um. There's there's a motto that's really important to me. Yes, I live by it us. every day, and I forget what it is. So. It Great. Okay. Well, right. thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. This has well, been really 
totally wonderful. Yeah. Now, I'm actually so thinking fun. about all the answers. It's actually very, very, yeah. very interesting. But do I get a question? Um, yes. Sure. So what, what surprised you? Oh, me? Yeah. Gosh, let's see. Um, Anything? Uh, and if you want, like, surprised you in a pleasant way. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I don't know. Let me think. Um, you probably know me pretty well. I know, so. yeah, I know you pretty well. I mean, if, for me, what was what was fun about this was hearing you kind of show sides of yourself that are often, you know, sides of you that I, that I really mm-hmm. either admire and or love and or am sometimes, you know, puzzled by or inspired yeah. by. We're renovating this house right now and, and the, the discussion around beauty and aesthetics is a really interesting one. So I think having you describe beauty as the most overrated virtue um, doesn't entirely surprise me when <laughs> yeah. I think about it, but it was yeah. interesting to have you come up with that one first. So maybe sure. that and... Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. maybe that. Good. Well, um, I think I think mottos are really great ways to communicate things. So you can boil things down to a pithy. I, actually, one one sound bite I crafted. Maybe we'll go close with this. One sound cra- bite I crafted that I really liked was um, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Oh, that's right. That was building off of this old ad by the United Negro College Fund that you know mind is a terrible thing to waste. But you and, talked about this in the context of sort of rising education levels. Right. Well, no, financial it, crisis, right? I, I, I think it actually was actually education mm-hmm. first. And then Tom, it became Tom Friedman heard it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this but, is the motto to say this again. Well, it's just yeah. a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, yeah. and um, yeah, yeah. that's not. It's more like for social decision making rather than right. personal. Maybe it's true in your personal life too. But uh, crisis moments are times when things are in flux, and you can sometimes pull off a, an, an important change. Um, but I, I do like, you know, kind of. Uh, this is one of the things that I've really enjoyed about you know getting to know you is you've helped me appreciate how much I really love words. Mm-hmm. And so even though I have trouble with spelling, actually, like if we didn't have to mess with all those letters, I, I just would love would love the words. And so, so I like the. Um, the 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 sound and feel of of that one. There's another one I I've kind of attributed to Gordon Brown, and I actually saw it in a PowerPoint that somebody else, you know, put together attributed to Gordon Brown. So it's kind of like I'm seeding one, which is um, in establishing the rule of law, the first five centuries are always the hardest. <laughs> and and he said, as somebody on his staff told me, he said something like that. But I like kind of like crafting it in the right way. So so there's some there's some kind of motto I rather liked recently, but uh, escapes the mind. Mm. But a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Also means don't get sidetracked by what people want from a crisis, which is to distract you. Mm. Yeah, and to actually, mm. some people will get things done, and so in some ways, yeah. not to get distracted, but to. Yeah. And I like mm. this whole theme of integrity yeah. throughout these well, answers. Well, yeah. and and to, stick, it, it, to stick to your guns even when there's so many yeah. forces like, sort of yeah. buffeting you. Yeah. There, there is also um, a, a cartoon that um, by Shel Silverstein that um, has these two guys in, um, in a dungeon with like a tiny window with bars like, you know, like 30 feet above them and they're chained to the wall and one turns over to the other and says, okay, here's my plan. And I've always loved that cartoon. And, and I've showed it to people sometimes. They, they can't even get what it is I'm trying to say. But um, it's that, you know, and like in a, with your crisis, it made me think of this, um, that, you know, even in crisis, there's something you can do. And you want that optimism of, okay, like, all right, what are we going to do now? Like, what's our plan? And even when it looks naive and, you know, like excessively optimistic, you just kind of live by that and, to a surprising degree, things 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 will work out. So, um, so here's my plan, and you know, let's not waste this crisis. <laughs> and workable code. And workable code. Yeah, rough consensus, working code. Working, working code. code. Working code. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, this Paul. This has been great. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you so Yay. much. <laughs>